Paul Leonard, thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. So we're going to start this by introducing your magazine, uh, magazine where you're a contributor, Power Magazine. So make sure you guys pick it up at Barnes & Noble. Uh, you're a, uh, a contributor there. You have an excellent article on strength and strength gaining, man. So congratulations. Um, I want to start this by talking about a little story about lifting at your house. So you are, you're the kind of guy that wants to make sure you'll stop what you're doing just to make sure that everybody around you is getting better. So it was the kids and I, and we were deadlifting. And I, I take pride on, I think, for, for a jiu-jitsu guy being strong and, and being um, a constant lifter. And, uh, and Brenda's doing her lifts, and you're you're giving her excellent feedback, you know, her posture, her knees, and her grips, and everything else. And, I, and I'm putting my weight on there. And, uh, but I see you start kind of like doing this little dance. And uh, you said, hey, let me get my reps in there. I said, okay. So this time, I think I have like 345s on each side, which for me and for the average human being is, okay, that's a lot. So you said, put the 45s on it. And uh, I'm going to go, how many? And without not even trying to be funny, not even looking back, I think you were doing something else. You just go, all of them. Okay. So we loaded up the bar, man. And Brenda and I were looking at each other because there's we load up the bar to the very, to the brim of the, of the bar. And you just got out there and you started repping. And that's when I realized the difference between your 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 uh, run of the mill, your Sunday morning, uh, or your Sunday your weekend warrior lifter like me, and a guy that's dedicated his life to lifting. And you just repped. I I, can't, I don't even know how much that how much weight that was, but you just started repping up and down that bar. So, in the article, you talk about what was the what was your the peak of your lift in deadlifting? Best. Competitive deadlift I ever pulled was 750 oh. at the uh, so that Jesus that was that was first in first in my class at the um, at the 2003 APF Senior Nationals which were at Universal Studios Hollywood so I pulled that when I was 35 the twins my wife was pregnant you know my family well um, we're family so my my wife was a month away from having her twins so I had been doing prior to that I had been doing not just I've been doing powerlifting since 1986. So that was 17 years deep into my powerlifting career, but I was also training strongman, and that's what that's what the article in this new magazine is about. Because what we've seen in the last, what I've seen in the last two decades since the late 90s, is the evolution of powerlifting. I should say strength athlete, because now we have strongman, we have competitive strongman, which if you blend the two in, you know, strongman exercises with traditional powerlifts. That's why we're seeing thousand pound deadlifts now. When I pulled my best deadlift, 750 in 19, in 2003, there was like only 12 guys, 10 guys in the world that had done 900. So, I mean, I was figuring, and I, I was figuring I'm going to get over 800. I'm going to be within shooting distance. And now, now we have Eddie Hall doing 1100, my friend in Avondale, Jerry Pritchard doing 1030. There's just been the, the evolution of the, the deadlift. Um, Jesus Christ. Which is, it's amazing. I mean, and, and of all the power lifts, to me, the deadlift is the, the, my favorite. I, I love deadlift. There's something, so the, the lifts allows you, that deadlift, it allows you, it provides a stage, number one, to prove an entire body strength. To be able to deadlift, you need the grip, the shoulders, the biceps, the back, the quads, the hamstrings, everything. Your entire body, your neck has to be, everything has to be perfect. Everything has to be strong. Everything has to be in line. But it also allows you to to put on a performance. And I hope people pick up the magazine. Um, and there's a picture there from one of your buddies. Um, and I, I I'm going to go to the article. Um, Josh Bryant. Josh Bryant. Yeah. Just a, a strength a strength phenom. Oh, what a savage! And the reason I want to point out this picture, but I want people to buy the magazine and go to page 36 on this, is he's lifting. This weight, I don't even know how much it is. It's a lot. But it's not only the the lift without the performance. It's when he's doing the lift, his face is not necessarily straight, but it looks over to the side with the with the face of the face of conquer lit, you know, gives the new slaves. You know, he just looks over like it, it's crazy, man. It's 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 one of the most to me it's one of the most fascinating and powerful lifts that there are. Yeah, it, and it's it's there, there's no dispute now in powerlifting. It's gone through an evolution. There's bench shirts and squat suits, and I wore that 
at times. I've competed raw, I've competed with that support gear. But the true people that are strength athletes know that nothing helps at deadlift but testicular fortitude. I mean, it's dip, grip, and rip. And if you stand up with it, it just it's it's the most savage. And when you do it right, there's a high. Um, I know you guys are huge music fans. I am too, not as much as as your son, but um, like Van, I was growing when I was going through high school, my formative years, like Van Halen. Yeah. And and um, even, it, it, you know, David Lee Roth went to Sammy Hagar, but there's a line in um, Dreams, world turns black and white. When you pull, when you lift heavy enough, you don't see color. You see chromies. Yeah. And you get this you get this euphoric rush, and it does. It goes right through your neck. And you're like, I mean, you can't you can't duplicate that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You are. And, and for a, a power lifter, our personalities, we love our teammates, and I have a picture in there of all my old buddies in California. We love having a crew, but my personality was like, look, I can be a great deadlift even by myself. Sometimes I've had to, you know, I've focused since I moved, when I moved here to Arizona, my focus has been on my family and I made a deal with my family. Hey, I'm going to make sure, you know, you're the priority and so forth, but I can still deadlift in my garage. And you're, still competing. I have to. and you're still competing. That's what's amazing because um, a lot of times we're talking about like the training trends or like our competitions and stuff. And you're like, Oh, I have a meeting. A month and a half and and it'll be visible because a lot of times it's like oh maybe you're getting in shape you know maybe it's just out of you know taking care of yourself better and you're like no have a meet and it shows you know you're leaner you're thicker and you're like yeah, I mean, I've, I've been deadlifting and I've, I've lifted with you when you're starting to prepare for that and it's like um and you're always very gracious it's like oh you should come with me you know lift and i'm like dude i would just be slowing you down but it's uh, you're right it's like it's the the deadlift is one of those where it's i can i can be great by myself I don't need anybody else. I could just load up the bars and just keep lifting and lifting and proper form. But you have the you have the knowledge to be able to do this. Um, you have the knowledge to be able to do that. Your average person couldn't really do it without the risk of getting hurt or not knowing the range of reps I need to be chasing. Um, but I want to talk real quick. I want to go back to your you were talking about the different in training between strongman and powerlifting and how the combination of both has made the power lifter stronger right that's correct what what was the traditional power lifter um routine prior to the merging of both well because you're you're being tested for um you're being tested for your one rep repetition maximum in a contest right. it power lifting would get into low reps um and um which in my experience the best way to get strong in the deadlift is three to five reps you can occasionally do lower reps and test a single every six weeks or so but high reps never work for me um but that being said you have all this musculature that wasn't getting worked so what happened was in 2000 i was doing a meet in san luis obispo and i went out to squat and it the squat i got a little crooked and i went down and i popped my knee and at the time i was 33 my first son was on the way i was like oh man this is a mess this is messed up um, maybe it's time to rethink this. But then I met a strongman named Kevin Kinsey, and he said, no, come, come, come train strongman. So what it was with strongman, we almost trained distance, you know, and then I trained really hard and I rehab my knee, not by, I had some therapy on it, but I never had a surgery at that point. I've never had a lower body surgery. Um, but it's, it's the amount of work. So it'd be like you here in jujitsu, like if you don't roll, X amount of hours or matches, minutes, whatever, however you train your volume. Powerlifting, I wasn't getting enough volume in. So that's why in my early 30s, I stagnated. Well, strongman, let's take the yoke, 700 pounds. And then I trained for a contest where we had to take the yoke 750 pounds and go 100 feet and then drag back 750. And I was able to do that in a minute and 40 seconds. We had two minute limits. I mean, afterwards, I saw. I saw visions like uh, like <laughs> Ruben, Angels, yeah. like Ruben and I were talking yesterday. Your previous guest, I'd never been in a sweat lodge, but let me tell you something. I was <laughs> within my. I was like, but I came in fifth overall yeah. in a big contest in Boston on that. And um, so, how many times did my legs bend and contract? Hundreds, right? So I got away from that heavy low rep. Powerlifters are very, and I was that, and I am that. But like, we're all like, oh, what's my one rep max? I wasn't doing enough work. My volume wasn't increasing. Therefore. If you know how, if you want to build a pyramid, the higher you go, the bigger your base you need. 
And power, sometimes you get caught up in that. Like, oh, I go. You're you looking know, at the tip, but you're not looking at the base. Right, you're, you're not free. Yeah, you're right. not laying the work. And if you ever, you know, you and I are in a, in, in a somewhat similar line of work. But if you ever just sit outside in a work site and you watch how people get things built from the pyramids to the present, there's just work. They're carrying stuff. They're doing stuff every day. It's not like some, okay, let's all run with the tile right now. No, they just bring it in. And then they have a, it, it, that you need some of that. And you don't want to get too caught up in power lift and not doing the work. So, I mean, to this, to this day, that's what this article is about. And my, I've learned in, in my experience and what you see, too, in just the strength world is that's why these strong men are so ridiculously strong. You know, like you can't deadlift heavy week after week, but you can work the muscles in different. It's like Louis Simmons, the West Side Barbell, the conjugate. The sum is greater than the whole. So the strong men figured out, well, you can't deadlift heavy every week, but if you do the yoke one week and then drag the next week, you're getting your hamstrings, your hips. Nothing will make you – the only thing that will make you as close to strong as doing a yoke, if you don't have a yoke, is zercher squats. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as those, like, UFC shows took off where they show people um, – Doing their workouts. Doing their workouts. Yeah, and yeah. I said, oh, they're zercher squatting. Yeah. You know, because I got up to the point. I zercher squatted 515 once. I mean, deep. In here, took it off, went down, went, you know, and I was – my stomach was so strong. I mean, I'll be 50 in a few months. I've never had a back injury. When In 1987 – my first year out of high school, I saved up some money because my back was a little stiff. I made a mistake. I did stiff leg deadlifts with straight legs off a bench. Six-inch stretch I didn't need. So I saw a chiropractor. And this chiropractor took an x-ray in my low back, and I had to pay for it. My dad wouldn't pay for a chiropractor. Right. You know, he, insurance, yes, but not this. So the chiropractor said, son, look at your back. This is when I was 19. He goes, you have the back of a 70-year-old. Well, so I'm, I'm probably over 100 now. Yeah. Oh, easily, man, easily. <laughs> but you learn how to condition yourself properly when you love it. Right. But that's the funny thing about doctors, man. It's uh, they they don't understand what we do as, as competitors, right? Whether it's lifting, whether it's boxing, whether it's fighting. They really don't understand that. They, and you're right. We have to um, – we were talking about this. Uh, competitors have a have a weird way of looking at life where we romanticize the future, right? We romanticize the sacrifices, the the damage that we put on our body. There's something romantic about. Um, there's something romantic for me. I'll I'll give you an example. For me, there's something romantic about entering tournaments. Like it's you know right now we're jujitsu is moving to the realm of super fights. Everything is about super fights. Um, this guy versus this guy, and he gets the entire camp, you know, camp uh, excited, and everybody wants to come out and see it. But for me, as a competitor, I'm not there yet. Maybe because I come from like an older generation of wrestling in the in the early early '90s, you know, um, and then moving on to early competition in jiu jitsu. To me, there's something romantic about entering a tournament. It's you and um, the you and the 17, 20 other guys, you know, that enter your division and we're not done till there's an absolute winner. And everybody, you gotta pay the piper, right? There's, everybody's paying the sacrifice to win that match. Nobody makes it to the finals healthy. You can pretend you're healthy, you can pretend you're all smiles, but you know, um, nobody makes it to the finals healthy. Everybody's, everybody's little by little, you're starting, um, you're starting to, to have little injuries, you get banged up in this fight more than the other. Um, you look around and the amount of tape that starts appearing in the competitors is just like oh, that wrist wasn't you know wasn't taped yesterday, that ankle wasn't taped yesterday you know and and it's just and now you make it to the finals and it's and your body is your body's a mess and it's 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 here it's your mindset right so it's the same thing with lifting it's no we're not done until I win until somebody wins you know that's right oh it's it, it's. Powerful. And under that condition, that's the thing about me. Like, I, I, I'm i like anybody that lifts weights. I met, I can't tell you how many people I met. Like, oh, I know someone like you, but twice as strong. Hmm. No. no. I mean, because I totaled 2,000 pounds. The, the best anyone's ever done is 3,000. So some, there's a lot of stronger guys than me. But I never got, it never was to the point where it was, where it was more, like, I, to the point I was like, mm-mm. And, and I needed to do that. Like, you, like, like you, you like you saying your jujitsu is changing. When I did when when I made the deal with myself when I was a got hooked in powerlifting, it was the senior nationals. That was the goal to go to that. And we also had weight classes. So my my life as soon as I woke up in the morning, I said, how can I become good enough to go to the senior nationals? So I I made that deal with myself in 1986. 
I worked. I've had a job since 82. I got a college degree. I graduated with honors, believe it or not. And, but it took me till 98. It took me 12 years to go to the seniors in Chicago and place fifth. And I was with just everybody that before the internet, you'd hear these guys. Like you, if you had heard of like Hickson or, or these legends and then just to see them like a Gary Frank, you know, to see Jim Verone at six, four, three eighty with abs. He was in a chair like this in the back room. Jesus Christ. But, but they're all like, you're one of them. You're at the seniors. You're there. Right? You're there. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's just, it, I went to the seniors adult male three times. I went to Chicago in 98. I went to York, Pennsylvania in 99, York, you know, York Barbell. And then I went in Universal Studios in 03. Each time I came in fifth. Um, couldn't couldn't win, but... But you were running with the Wolves, man. You were running with that, the Wolves. That's exactly right. And, you know, like, people people might... I, I tell people, don't lie. As soon as you popped out of your mom, the first thing, everybody looked at that baby. The first thought, they said, why? I hope he mastered the quadratic equation. No, I hope he's strong. I hope he's strong. <gasps> and I was blessed. Somebody, I mean, I was born four pounds, six ounces, premature and sick Jeez. in ICU. Yeah. But my, I know my family loved me. My grandmother, my grandmother who I was closest to, she's, I always knew, I always knew you were going to be strong. And she was, she didn't, she didn't say much like that, but she was strong. Yeah. You know, she lost her, her, her first husband. She lost young. So she worked for the phone company for like four years. Oh, that must have been a blast in Massachusetts at night, going in at night on the train when it's snowing. But like that, and my dad for 10 years in the 70s working two jobs. Like, I, everything to me is strength. I look, and, and I, I will say this, I try to be, a, I'm prejudiced if people aren't strong. You know, whatever that may be, whoever that may be, if they make a, a non-strong decision. It doesn't have to be about lifting weights. It's about a mindset. The character. The yeah, character. If you stand, yeah. If you, are you, are you willing to withstand the... The, the criticism of your decision or or you make a decision that just pleases everybody right yeah yeah no that's no i'm with you man i'm with you it's like that the character the strength that you just like you said it doesn't have to be the strength it doesn't have to be the physical strength but it's a mindset you know the mindset strength whether you know it's uh it's if you're willing to make the decision that is right knowing that there's going to be criticism knowing that is there's going to be that you're going to be attacked for your decision you know and, and there's people that are just not capable of that. Like, hear people talk about it, like, oh, I don't like conflict. You don't have to like conflict, but you have to like making the right decision and standing by your decision. Um, I want to bring up, uh, like, a funny joke, because we have a, we have a Vinny, uh, a mutual friend of ours, <laughs> that Vinny is on the opposite side of the spectrum, meaning Vinny's all about the, the aesthetic. What do you look like, right? Vinny's about... You know, the shoulders and the traps and the biceps. I was like, oh, look at this baby's leg, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but he's not, he's not into the strength. It's like how much you live. It's about what he looks like, right? And you and him were going at it one day. And it was funny because I think that you guys were talking about weight. And he, and he said he's under 300 pounds. And you're like, oh, you're under 300 pounds? And you check mail in your applications? That's cool, I guess. I don't know. Dude, you said it. The way you said it was phenomenal, but it was just, and that took that with me. And and my my thought process ever since I heard that was, I'm going to be that 300 pound man here always, you know, because yes. there's that. You have to be the 300 pound strong person, human being, whether it's men or women, but you got to be 300 pounds in your mind to make that decision, right? Always. So whenever I'm facing a, a situation, man, I'm like, okay, I got to be the 300 pound dude, you know? Uh, because, you know, running an academy and, 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 making decisions, whether it's, you know, with your own kids or a business decisions, whatever it is, it's, you're not always going to make the popular decision. You're going to make the decision that is, that benefits the village and, and not the individual. And knowing that, you know, you're knowing that that's criticism was coming. It's, uh, um, it's, it's important to be that 300 pound man. You know? it, I couldn't agree more with you. And it's, you know, nowadays there's memes and stuff and you see it's like, you know, no hex given. Let's say that. Yeah. Like people respect that. But I, when I think back to, to where I'm at and why I'm at that and, and driving over here today and, and going to, you know, we're going to do this podcast. I mean, it's easy to, I'm a, I'm a word association guy. Like, like I think you, I think friend, you know, um, you think of something. And when I think of powerlifting and what drew me to that and then strength athletics because i did competitive strongman and i just i love it was i love the objectivity in a world of subjectivity 
And it starts for young males. You're in high school, like, oh, you're cute. He's not. You're in the popular crowd. And I always had a lot of friends and got plenty of dates. <laughs> edit, edit. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my beautiful wife. But, um, I mean, that being said, I love the objectivity. And, like, long after I'm gone, fortunately, like, I've been able to mentor. And it's mentor people you really don't know. Like, you referenced Josh Bryant, who does Jailhouse Strong. And we've talked about him. Josh used to leave his house in Santa Barbara on Saturday mornings by 6 a.m. to come squat with us at 9 a.m. in Orange County. Why do you think he ended up squatting 900 when he was 22? Youngest guy to bench 600 so rods because he wanted to, right? And um, But the objectivity of, of powerlifting and strength athletics, um, like like what you, what, what you value in your world is a black belt and – Maybe not above all else because there's so much more. I'm not in that world. I just see it. But that's a standard. You know what I'm saying? Like for me, long after I'm gone, I mean, go ahead, roll 500 pounds across the across the floor. Roll 534. That was my best bench press at yeah. my best. I mean, I, I military press 320 in a contest. And, and you know, just have at it, you know, and flipping. I flipped an 800-pound tire yeah. 100 feet in 90 seconds. I mean, it. You, you next. Yeah. That'll last. That doesn't, that wasn't subjective. So it's like that yeah. in life. You can't go, I can't go through, I can't stand subjectivity. I can't say, you know, and, and um, whether that, you know, there's a certain objectivity that just will always resonate with me. This is real. Um, and um, I mean, that's why, that's why I enjoy my kids that have all fought through you. You know, here I, I, I used to think, ah, oh, big tough guy and all that stuff. It's a mindset, but my kids, all three of my kids, compliments of you have been in hundreds of more fights than me because they fight repeatedly. They learn struggle, and I encourage them. There's been some ups and downs, but but what they learn here at Damio, what they've learned through jujitsu, it's um, you, you can't you can't put a price on that. You can't you can't, you can't replace that. But no. There's only there's only so many. There's only a few atmospheres that are still creating warriors in society today, and I think that uh, I mean it's I, I find I find the uh, I find the internet to be a, real, a little bit ridiculous, you know, because in the internet it's where this crazy stupid ideas are created, where you know we shouldn't promote masculinity in our boys, you know, because that leads to rape or you know or sexual abuse or whatever it is. Um, and there's there's so many more stupid ideas like that. It's it's not. It's masculinity leads to strong men. It's you make the right decision. You treat the women with respect, but you are the three hundred pound man. And you and again referencing to Ruben, let's build those shoulders, baby. You know, and it's not just the physical shoulders; it's the mental shoulders to face the challenges in life. You know, um, but that's you know going back again. It's like there's only so many places in the world where we're still creating the strong individuals under the proper mentorship the gym is one of them you know like your guy like you were saying he was driving three hours to go lift why because you're a product of those that surround you a hundred percent i hundred percent believe that and this guy knew okay i need to be i want to be a product of that so i will drive three hours to go lift with those guys you know Exactly. Um, well, well, in, in the wrestling room in in high schools, man, like they're still creating men, you know. Yeah. And for those that are and the phrase the the phrases the joke is for those that are stupid enough to keep showing up, you know. Same thing with jujitsu, man. You, you know, we, we've done we've done smart thing here at the academy at Dami where we're creating like a fundamentals programs where it's not just show up and start fighting from the first day. It's let's equip you with the right tools to start showing up. But even then, you have to be stupid enough to continue to show up every single day because you come here or you, you go to live with you guys, you're going to work. You're going to work. You might not believe in yourself, but I believe in you. And because I believe in you, you're going to work and you're going to work till the work is done. You know, exactly. there's no stress flag. There's no, I'm tired. No, it's, we're not done. You're my time. That, that's exactly right. And like what you said nowadays with the internet, this new generation, I, I'll meet people, and I'll talk to them occasionally. And I, for example, it's happened here in town. And oh man, man, you're obviously into it, you know. And when I go to a contest, even in Phoenix, I always wear like a U of A something, and I try to talk to people. I love going to contests. I meet new friends and and all that. And I'm always like, I'm trying to get people together. But nowadays with the internet, kids are like, 
I, I met a prospect and he was from Vail. He's like, well, I'm not Vail or World Bad. That'll take an hour. Like, the, you know, that that's why, like, why watch how you guys raise yourself over here as fighters. That's why Yeshua goes to Frangina's. Like, we used to, when I was at, as soon as I got my license, that was freedom to go to gyms. I mean, that's, I, I, I can appreciate nice cars, but my car, my powerlifting was always my anchor in my life. If my school's messed up, if I don't have enough money to eat, I have a problem. And if my car's messed up, which growing up in Massachusetts, my school, my college was five years. I went through five cars. They'd fall apart. I'd buy a $700 one rather than save up to buy the dream car. I'm like, how can I get to the squat stands? How can I, because I would go to a commercial gym. And um, nowadays, I mean, I, I, you can tell who's going to be successful because you, the big fish in a small pond, like get out. And we used to call it my, my, one of my first main training partners, Mark Gaboni, who now lives up in Phoenix, coincidentally, and raises dogs. Um, but um, he and I were the same age. We met at the same gym, but I was coming from the city. He was coming more from the suburbs. But we Saturdays, we'd go, we'd call it road trip. We'd have money. And that's how we would find out, for example, when the WW, WWF wrestles were in town. Hey, they're up the North Shore, which is over an hour. Let's go there. That's how I saw, I saw Ultimate Warrior, like who, God rest his soul, but doing upright rows with 315. Oh. And he's talking to himself. I saw him having a cast. What, what does he say? What does he say? He's doing this. He's like, that's right. He's right. Well, he was like, like his character would talk. He was talking up above. He's like, did you see that? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm like, and when I tell you this guy's shoulders were... 32 inches across, Oh my God. you know, cause I've seen in my, in my desire, I've lifted, I've competed in 18 States and I've lifted in, I've been in about 37 States and I've lifted in most all of them. Um, it, just to go to find the best gym. And now with the internet, you could find stuff, you know, you can find that, but that's what I would implore anybody. If you're interested in something, go find it and not, not virtually. That's great. I look at Instagram too. Um, I look at YouTube and I'm fascinated with some of it, but go out there, you know what I'm saying? Right. And find it. And that's what, you know, that's what you guys do here. You know, I was, I moved to California. Um, it took a little while because in my mind, I thought when I showed up, showed up in California after I graduated college, it would be like pumping iron. <laughs> then I'd go down and Golden in Venice was, it wasn't, there was no Arnold and Frank. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I saw some, but like I ended up, my wife was from Santa Fe Springs, which is next to Norwalk. I ended up in, at a gym called American Eagle. And who's in there but C.T. Fletcher, my good friend, um, and Rich Schoenberger, another guy who benched 600 pounds. Just, I mean, I, I've never seen arms on a human being like C.T. Fletcher. I would say his arm, one of his arm weighed 25 pounds. He hung it on your shoulder Just and stuff. It, yeah, because yeah, we would be working out, and then it was right across the street. Oh. There was a place called the Burger Basket, and halfway through the workout, there'd be CT with big eating his burgers. But um, now everybody, a lot of people on YouTube know him and so forth, it, as well they should. But I mean, I I wouldn't have found that stuff if I stayed at home. You know right. what I'm saying? And then by the time I was 28, and bought my first house, I built it. I mean, my first, I built the gym in my garage. That's what I wanted. Yeah, Southern California, 20 million people. It was kind of like the Sopranos when they would have the who would host the poker game. I knew the hot places all over town. It was garage gyms. There wasn't too many good commercial gyms, but so I built it. I'm not going to sit there and wait. Don't make right. an excuse. So at its at my peak, we had um, by the late '90s. I everyone I had seven guys in my gym. Everybody could officially squat 700. Everybody could bench 400. Everyone could deadlift 700. I wasn't what I watch you. So I look back and like I watch you, and that's where I, I'm so envious of your personality because people would approach me sometimes and be like, hey, can I come to your place? I'm like, no. No. <laughs> I, know what I, I know what I can do for you, but yeah. what can you do for me? And it wasn't arrogance. It just was I, – I was too focused, and I still had another career. But I was like, man, you are you don't get the invite. We'd go – we'd roll to a contest, and we'd have our own shirts, Yorba Barbell. And in the back would say, weakness is a crime. People would come up to me like, oh, man, can I have a shirt? I'm like, no. No. Can I buy one? I'm like, no. And then I'm thinking, man, I should have. <laughs> Textiles. You know, bro, 25 yeah. bucks a t-shirt, man. Yeah, that's a 50% 50 profit mark. Yeah. 100%. Right. Anyways, I've learned as I've gone, I I don't have the same. I'm not the same as you. I can't because you'll find, and you've experienced this, but I think you just keep moving forward. I've tried to, but like I've given people experience and invested my time. And sometimes they're just, they don't heed it. You're like, you know. And that's rough, man. And that's rough. So like. When people want to, to it's, it's different, right? People want to come over and they're like, I want to do what you're doing. Because that's pretty much what they're saying is, I mm -hmm. want to be something 
closer to what you are, you know? And and you're like, okay, you know, but they, they come from the background of like, well, I saw it on YouTube or I saw I see the UFC and it doesn't look that hard. And <laughs> right. And then you start putting them through and they think they're going to start showing up and fighting. And then it's like, it's an hour and a half class, sometimes two hours, right? The first 30 minutes alone, 30, 40 minutes, is just conditioning and drilling. The next 30 or 40 minutes is the technique, which is what we're working on, plus drilling. And then after that, depending on what we're doing, we might be rolling 10 minutes, we might be rolling six minutes, we might be rolling five minutes. It's not going to be easy, and we're going to do that for another 30 to 40 minutes. And then we're done, right? Right. And they they can't grasp that, you know, and, and there's like you said, like it's an investment, man. It's an investment and and uh, and obviously a lot of thought goes into like every time we have a new student because we, we get we we sign up people like every other day, you know. And while retention is our retention of students is great, but because of those programs that we have that we're allowing people to to not have to come in and fight right away, but to come in and learn. Um but every once in a while, you do get that guy that he knows better than you, right? Like you're trying to tell him how to deadlift, and he's like, yeah, 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 okay. You know, I'm like, okay, you know better. Right. You know? And then he gets hurt. Um, same thing, we have the, we have those guys and girls that come in, and and they and – I, and I figure out what the mindset is. I, it puzzled me for the longest time. They don't want to come in and learn. They want to come in and show you what they know. And that – is a complete waste of time. I don't care what you know. You want to come in to learn, you know. So leave what you know. You carry it, but make sure your cup is empty every single time you're coming through those doors, you know. So, but it's it's very difficult, man. When you have those students that don't want to learn, you will have those students that that don't understand that don't understand what they're doing wrong, and they don't understand what the what their role is as an academy, what their role is as an instructor. Um, the biggest one is the guy that competes, loses, or shit, it, it, or wins, and never comes to you and says, "Coach, what do you think?" You know, because they're happy. Um, they're happy with they're happy with handshakes and the shoulder pads. You know, um, to me, like one of the most significant conversations that I've had is when I was competing at the Pants, uh, twenty seventeen. Um, made it to the finals, and I'm, you know, I. I have my phone and I would turn it off so I wouldn't get any notifications before the fight. So I'm focused on listening to my mm -hmm. music. I was done with the day. I turn it on and it's like all this coach. We're so proud of you. You inspired me. And it's, it's, it fills your heart with love and, and, and excitement, you know, and, and pride. But then there's one message, man, from this fucking animal, Michael Meadow. And in the sea of, I love you. I'm proud of you. And this and that. Hey, idiot, your feet are flat. Get that shit, you know, get that going. Got it. You know, that's what I needed. That's what I needed. Mike Romero, of the, he must be part Russian. Yeah, oh, dude, he has to be, man. Yeah, because he was not an out, no congratulations, though. Hey, your feet are flat. And he was right because in the semis, man, the dude kept throwing me and throwing me and throwing me. I would get inside and the dude would throw me and then we'd scramble. And, uh, and then he was right. My feet were flat, but he was, it was that, right? It was the, I don't need to be surrounded by the people that are only... That don't have anything to offer other than hey, great, great job, congratulations. You know, I need that guy that has some lift and good lift, but you need to fix this, you know. And I need to be open for that. Right. Well, yeah. and, and your your um, world has that, and it's our it's a mainstream cultural thing now. People say white belt mentality. Nobody has that. There's no lifting phrase like that. But like somebody was talking to me yesterday at your at your uh, spectacular in house uh, tournament across the way there and. He's like, oh, I want to come lift. And, and he's like, oh, I am. But he starts going on what he hasn't been doing. I said, listen, look, the, the weights come off the bar just as easy to go on. I'll put them on. I, I just, I want to see you try and better yourself. And that's you as a coach and, and me, whenever I get the chance to coach people, that's if people don't see progress, that's, that's on you. It might be on them. Did you eat? Did you sleep? What's the greatest performance enhancing drug in the world? Sleep. sleep. I mean, it makes a PED. It makes everything. You know, and people will people will drive past. I'll drive past Dami on the way home. People go to the vitamin shop and GNC and and what, all these places that sell supplements. You pass eight supermarkets that have really what you need. The best chemicals is food. But um, 
you know, you want to you want to put as a coach, you want to put people in an environment to succeed. I'm going to give you every chance to succeed. Some of it's on you, but it's on me. But shame on me if I don't give you the right advice. As right. we know, it's the famous quote. It's not so hard for me to give him the wrong advice. It's when Arnold's talking, yeah, it's cutthroat. But <laughs> he's an icon. icon. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. But um, yeah, no, it's um. Uh, so I have learned, you know, when it comes to the concept of that's why I write now. Um, I have more, a little more time now. My kids are a little older, so when they're doing homework, I'm writing. I'm modeling what I want to give back and do. But and at the same time, I'm not one of those parents. I give you my kids the the environment to do homework, but I'm not doing your homework. You're all right. teenagers now; it's on you. But like when you when you teach back, you have to think, right? Like so, therefore, to explain it, and and for an, a super advanced guy like you, and I have been at some advanced stages of strength athletics. I have to always think, but it, what does it bring you back? It grinds you, to, grounds you to the fundamentals. Look, this is what this is. You know, train hard, put the stress, eat, recover, rest, repeat. You know, and the same thing. And I, I, I would not imagine jujitsu ever gets jujitsu yeah. ever um, ever gets um, too advanced that you need to forget the fundamentals, right? No, it always just goes back to the fundamentals. I mean, it, it, any activity does, you know what I'm saying? I mean, fiscally, you want to be successful, um, save more than you spend, <laughs> put it away. I mean, you, you know, think about when you think about um, criteria and, and fundamentals, that's what that's what makes you successful. In life. And I think a lot of people find that boring. You know what I'm saying? I, I never did. I mean, I just looked and like, like you said, like. In 1986, I did my first contest. 1988, I went to my first Teenage Nationals. And um, a guy, I came in second. A guy absolutely, his name's on the tip of my tongue, Sean Colbeth. He kicked, he kicked my ass. Snorting a big bottle of ammonia, benched almost 500. Our bookends, our squat and deadlift kind of close. I was like, oh my goodness, how am I ever going to beat him? Never saw him again in the contest, and he never did as good again. Um, then I went to the collegiate nationals in 90 and all that time I was a 242 er and then finally before I left Massachusetts, I used to train one of my training, um, colleagues was Jim, big Jim Soroka, collegiate national champion in the super heavyweights. And I was always like, I was always a 242 pound class or a 275, but in my heart, I wanted to be super, super. That's the, you wanted to check mail. 300 pounds, I mean, baby. What do you mean? I couldn't find a supermarket. Yeah. Does, does this work? Absolutely. Does this work? Yeah. So the goal, I was always around from Mark, from my high school buddy, Rafi Hussain, who benched almost 400 in high school. Now he's a judge. Jim Soroka in college, super heavyweight. I was always envious, but I was willing to put in the work, the, the 10, 15 years it took to build up because I didn't. Yeah, hour or two drive. You couldn't. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you can't flex fat. I didn't want to be a big fat I, and I still had a job where they tested me and tested my physical and all that good stuff. And I had to go through to get in that line of work. I had to go through agility tests and all that stuff and a basic physical. I mean, so, but ultimately for almost 10 years, I was at over 300 pounds strength athlete that I could do anything I set my mind to, you know, right. if I if it was in a bar, I was going to, I was going to give it hell. I was going to get it. Yeah. And, um, I, 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 I don't think everybody's of that mindset. And there's a time where I was like, oh, but that I can still impart. People can be the best they can be. People can definitely be trained. And there's, uh, there's, I'm not a big, it's, it sounds romantic, right? But I've seen the t-shirts. I'm like the t-shirts. They say you can't teach hard or, you know, something where there's always the line between us versus them, you know, like, oh, they're, they're this. And you, if you don't have that already within you, you can never be that. I want to agree with that, man. I think that, I think we all start already. There's definitely, I don't know what it is, but there's, you know, there's people start at different points in their life, you know, because of life experiences, what they've been taught, the people that surround them when they were little. But I, I, I can, I definitely believe that with the right mentorship, you can take somebody that, and we see this here all the time. You have a guy that comes in and is kind of timid, never been in a fight in their life, you know, their hands are soft, you know, like in, like in Joss, you're like, look at this hand. counting money. You counting money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't need this. And, uh, but you, you know, again, you mentor them, you, they have their first taste of struggle and, and a crushing defeat. And that's happened in their life before. And they always walk away. But now they're in an environment where, no, man, we're not going to walk away. 
we're going to learn from this. Like quitting is not an option. And that's a huge turning of the page for those guys. So I believe you can coach somebody into being something great, but it takes it takes them to do it. It takes them to not quit and walk away. There's there's a big uh, my biggest issue with people is, you know, like uh, like the invitation to to live with you. You know, like I there's because uh, you you have an open gym. You know, you're like, hey man, come live with me. I'm there every Sunday. You know, and uh, or Saturday and Sundays, and uh, and it's always like, you know, like when I mention somebody. 8 a.m., you know, or 7. It's like a 20-minute drive. 20-minute drive. Dude, there's people that drive two, three hours just to go train with the best in the world. And I'm asking you to tra- go drive 20 minutes to train with one of the best in the world, and you don't want to do that? And it's the same thing here with, like, jiu-jitsu, man. I have people that – I have both ends of the spectrum. I have people that live by the casino. You know, and it's a 40 minute drive to come train here and they do it and they never complain. But yet have people that are, dude, I live like 20 minutes from your academy or 10 minutes, you know, okay, what do you want me to go train, go train in your garage? Like everything progress involves sacrifice. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with today's society is the difference between, between what you want or your goals and your ambitions but yet your work ethic are two separate things. You're not willing. You say you want this, but your work ethic says this. You want this, but when it comes time to to go get it done, but I'm tired. You know, like Arnold said, like, oh, Arnold, I need eight hours of sleep. The latest studies show that eight to nine. No, 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 no. You know, and, and Arnold will take it through what his day was like, you know, like working construction, then going and lifting, and then going to um uh, English is second language at a public place, you know, and and then going to bed. He goes, I only got four to five hours to sleep. You know what I say? Sleep harder. You got shit to do, right? Ex- exactly. Sleep harder. Get shit done, man. And that's the thing. It's like, you know, like when you tell people, it's like, hey, let's go get this done. But I'm tired. Like yesterday, I had a rough day. Okay. What what, what, what what was a rough day? What was everything rough day? still attached? Yeah, you know, like you, you get in this and, and you can't you get into this lifestyle and um, yeah, I've had some injuries and I can give some good advice how to avoid them. Every time I had an injury, it was because I did something stupid. Right, um, but we learn from it, right? Yeah, we learn from it. And if there's injuries, like I say, oh, this hurts. And you you were talking about this earlier when when by the time I would get to the nationals and like my, I was always in with mentors, I got guys like Art LeBear. And uh, Terry McCormick and, and Dave Shaw, these these world champion powerlifters. They by the time you're at the senior nationals, that's why it meant so much to me because it wasn't like oh everything was perfect. I had a great day, and at my gym I squatted 800. That's okay. Did it involve a plane ticket? Did it involve a weigh in, a qualifying? Were you there against everybody else? It was like all those times I came in that I used to live by the old powerlifting USA top hundred, and every time I made it, I I thought it was awesome, and I made the I made the top 25 a couple times which meant there were bigger lifts done in the United States. But every time I went to the nationals, I was fifth. Maybe something was easier in Ohio, or maybe the North Carolina meet was easier because it was in your backyard. And I would compete in my backyard too, because that promotes the sport. If you don't do stuff right where you're at, you know, you don't always have to travel. But I mean, by the time you get to that national level, it's all the same, same judging and everybody's hurt. And you want to know what we say. And you guys probably say the same thing in fighting. The only, the, it's just like your life advice you give to a guy. Hey, the only way to get over an injury is get another one. It's like when your girlfriend leaves you. you want to get over her? Get another. Get another girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. When your knee's killing you, then you forget your elbow. You, you know. Right. Um, fortunately, through what I've learned, I mean, I've had some injuries, had some surgeries in my upper body, tore some things, but I mean, I, I wake up pain free and I feel I feel great. You know, I'm I'm. I'm fixing to do, I've done contests in my teens. I'm going to do one in a couple months in my fifties. So it's all about, I mean, what drives you? You know, my dad died of medical malpractice. My dad had kyphosis, which is hunchback. Mm -hmm. So I saw he started bending over like this. So they, yeah. So they did a surgery, put rods in his back. And that really was the beginning of the end of him. Um, So when people like people will say, Oh, the, the deadlift, that's, Man, I'm lucky I can do it. You know, if I could drive someplace to go do something and, and I can get up and do it, I don't 
I, I'm so happy. Nothing's hurt. It, it, you know, a lot has to, when you see a family, for example, out, out to eat dinner, a lot has to go right. No one's in the hospital. They have enough money. No one's sick. You know, and if I get the chance to go to the gym four times a week, you know, life is and real, and, and, and everything's training when you get busy. I mean, everything's training who you hang out with, who you associate. My, you see me come in here and I don't see, I don't do this. I don't do jujitsu, but it's the highlight of my day when I can come see a friend. Cause you know what I do for work and, yeah. and, but I'm here and that means usually at least one of my kids is, you know, my oldest now plays football, which is a full-time commitment but was success, successful because of his daimyo, because of his jiu-jitsu, had the poise, you know, fighting in a tournament and fighting here, led to him being a, a starting quarterback in junior high, scoring his first touchdown. My kids, let alone all the fights they've been in, and, you know, my son Max was able to win an advanced Naga degree with your tutelage. Yeah. He's had some school issues with keep, keep him away. And then my daughter Mia has that. fought. But – the, the highlight of my day, that's training for me. When I walk in that door, even if I'm in my work clothes and I have that, as soon as I walk in here, I'm around positive people. Like right. when I saw Philip yesterday that, that, that runs the Erie now, which yeah. is your tribu- a tributary school, if you call that correct from you, a little right. south of here. I mean, I'm around successful people. In the five minutes I interact, that's training. It, it, well, it charges it boosts, you up. It boosts it, me it, up. Yeah. It's, there's, not, there's not a single time when I want to start talking to like people like you or like start talking to people like Philip and Frangina where – you walk away from that and, and number one, you are just automatically charged with positive energy. Number two, deep down inside, you start thinking, I haven't done enough. I need to do more. Mm-hmm. I need to do more. It's possible. But I want to I want to talk about your kids real quick, man. So because you you have found a formula to as far as your interaction with your kids, and and I, I believe I, I'm gonna brag a little bit, I believe I've I've found it too. But one thing that drives me insane about parents is parents are their kids' best friends. And I heard a phrase years ago, years ago, and I, from the second I heard it, I, I thought about it, I made it mine, and I told it to my kids. They, they were little, you know. And I told the kids, I said, I'm not your friend. I'm your father. And... I'm going to make decisions that will set you in the path to success. When you're a grown man and you're making your own decisions, I'll, I'm there to help you. I'm there to guide you. But then, I, only then, when you're successful and you're doing everything on your own, only then will I be your friend. You know, and and the reason I bring that up is because like we just had the tournament. You know, uh, last, yes, uh, yesterday we just had a tournament yesterday, and there's people like. There's people that understand what, what the simple the simple challenge of signing your kids up for a tournament, saying you will do this because these are the positive effects of trying to accomplish something bigger than yourself, such as a tournament. You're gonna go in there and you're gonna fight your fears, you're gonna fight, you're gonna fight your your doubts, you're gonna fight your your nervousness. Um, you you're gonna get in shape, your conditioning and your technique will grow. And on this day, the best you will show up to compete against other people that are bringing their best. And whether you win, whether you lose, whether you draw, you will grow out of that experience. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Because I'm your father. I'm your parent. And what drove me nuts, man, is I encounter so many parents that are like, ah, i got to talk to little Timmy, see if he wants to do this. He's just, he's just really nervous. He's, he's going through a lot. Your kid is six, man. He's not going through a lot. You're, what drives me nuts is when parents reflect their fears onto their kids. You're nervous. You're afraid. You're reflecting that on your kid. You're making your kid nervous. You're afraid of failure. Therefore, you're teaching your kid to be afraid of failure. Kids don't know. And it's been proven, dude, when they're, you know, and I'm sure you did this with your kids, but I would grab my, so my kids and I would put them on a the table and I'd go, jump. And every single time, obviously, they would look down and then they would see that it's, the, the depth of the table and uh, and I would go, come on. Okay. Boom. And they would jump. And I never taught my kids to be afraid. Never. You know, everything they did, it's, uh, it's, I always taught them to believe in themselves and to trust me. You know, like I never not caught him, you know, <laughs> like this asshole parents jump. Ah, pa. <laughs> Look, he fell. <laughs> but Elias has been big for a while. <laughs> well, I'm saying like a four year old. Yeah. Elias. Yeah. I'm 10 years old, but this kid was like easily. Yeah. Oh, God, so yeah. well built, big. Fucking <laughs> but 
But going back to the kids, man, it's, it's what are your thoughts on that? It drives me nuts when people reflect their fears on the kids and, well, do you want to do it to me? Like, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the worst thing you can do, I think, is it, look, I'm, I'm no parenting expert and, I, and I, I love talking to other parents that I respect because it's, it's a fight and it's day to day. So in terms of making sure... For me, I, I think back to I was a very competitive strength athlete. My, as soon as my eyes open in the morning, how am I going to make myself stronger? What, and I had the job, and then I, I and my greatest strength teams really came right after I got married, which was because there was more structure in my life. But having a, the first time I had a child, my oldest Lou, actually before we had Lou, we miscarried a baby, so that's very sad and yeah. like really hard on my wife. Me, I'm like, oh, this would be fine. But a woman, it's like, it's probably if a guy can't provide. Right. You're like, oh man, this is, I get it. So then we had a baby. Um, but she was, she got to stay home. We were fiscally doing okay. She stayed home and was real close to him. But like, I found for me, it was like, I'm really going to try hard to, to lead by example. And what I, what I, I don't know much, but I do know this. I do know, I'm going to give you opportunities I never had. I didn't know anything about jujitsu. Um, when I was when I was little, um, a little kid, not till I was in college that I could hear jujitsu. But um, but I'm going to give you opportunities I never had with, and they have. So I've I've done that. Um, I just I, I just will never let my child quit something. If you the the idea of a commitment, that's and what your word means and what you invest in time, effort, and if people do the same to you, pay it back threefold so it's so many lessons you learn right there i do know this though like i people would think um my oldest boy he can appreciate this he's his friends now that he's playing football like i did he's not he's certainly not big because you see my wife and i the combination there yeah. what is the offspring i mean most of my genetics for size and strength and pain tolerance went to my my daughter yeah. which is <laughs> her twin brother monster, yeah. Yeah, yeah she's impervious to pain especially for a you know, for for a for a younger girl. Um, but here's how I feel about this: My life will have failed if I don't introduce you to something as much as I love strength athletics and powerlifting and strongman, like whatever that may be. And they've been introduced to so much more than I have. So I'll never let you quit, and I'll support you. But at the same time, I realized that's why I need to keep doing my journey. I didn't want to be that guy. Oh, go get those pictures from the '90s. Um, look at this. You know, look what I did. Like. Right. I'm doing, and not what I did, it's what I do. This is what I do till the day I die. I try to be strong. And I'll provide for you. I'll give you what you need. I'm not going to give you everything you want. There's no, no one's being spoiled. Right. And I do want to see progress. With it, and not just, you know, as a person, as a human being, being empathetic, being a good part of society, finding your part in society. And at the same time, no hex given about some things. You know, now my kids are, my, you know, my daughter in middle school. She'll talk about middle school drama. And I'm like... She does it. I see. She doesn't see at times. Like you know, you could render that person unconscious if they were just too <laughs> Yeah, but but still, that I'm, I I respect her feelings, and we talk. I mean, they talk about you know, you talk about raising kids, quantity versus quality. I certainly try to be around with both. Right. You don't know when you're around for the quantity. I heard this. Somebody else said this. The quality will show up when I leave here at night. The other night, leaving here from Damio, what it's a it's a nine mile ride to my house. My daughter leans over. We're listening to music together, laughing because she's probably got the endorphins after another great training session here. And then she's like, "Oh, Dad, I love you." And oh. Like you won't get that, right? If you're not present, you're not there. You know, yeah. and um, so, powerful, man. so yeah, no, I I don't know all the answers, but uh, but not letting them quit, right? Never quit. So yeah, my my oldest, he was he started jujitsu on, and, and again, if people. If people want to talk about a story of a kid that that started on one side of the spectrum and now it's the other, like he's one of the most dominant blue belts in Arizona, you know, probably in the nation. And but he started as a kid that wouldn't shut up. He started as a kid that was, you know, easily distracted and the kid that talked to our class. And I'm talking like when he was like six, seven, you know, which is every kid, you know, at that age. Um, but as he started getting older, uh, probably like nine, nine years old, he, uh, he, he wasn't having fun in jujitsu. He didn't appreciate the struggle and he, and he did what every kid does at that age. He pitted mom against that, you know, and finally came to the point where he's like, I don't want to do jujitsu anymore, you know? And I said, like, 
you know, my wife, Brenda, was like, okay, we can't force him to do this. You know, which for you and me, we're like, ah, what do you mean we can't? Watch. You know, but, okay, so I took a step back and I said, okay, what do you want to do? And at the time, he had buddies playing baseball. So I said, okay, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm telling you how to do this. Whatever it is that you choose to do in life, you're going to do it 100%. You're not going to do something because you think it's easier. So in baseball, he, I would put him in his little team, and, and I demanded the same effort that I demanded from jiu-jitsu. I demanded that from baseball. So I would, I would go to a couple of his practices, and kids are running, and they're like, they're like it's like a step above walking, and they're chit-chatting. And I'm oh, there, man. And I'm no, like, oh, hell no. <laughs> I'm like, hey, let's go. Let's go. So he's like the only kid that is running out of that group, you know? <laughs> and he's looking back and like, that, but everybody else, oh, you're, the kids. you're my son. You're here to, you're here to work. You don't want to work in jiu-jitsu. You're, you're going to work in baseball, you know? So we put him through the ringer and that. And then finally he, same thing. I, I don't know what his thought process was, but if I can only imagine, I think he said, well, fuck, man, if I want to work this hard, might as well work in jiu-jitsu instead of this dumb sport of baseball. So eventually he came back to jujitsu and then years later, maybe, maybe like four years later, like we're having this conversation and he goes, Hey, I remember when I wanted to do baseball. I said, yeah, he goes, you're right. He goes, I wanted to do it because I thought it was going to be easy. And I was like, it probably was, but I wasn't going to let it be easy. You know, I was going to make it work. So yeah, man. So that was, that was validation for my thought. I was like, no, man, you're always going to work, you know? But so I think it's important for parents to hold their kids accountable in that regard, man. It's like, Yes, let their kids explore everything, but make them work, you know, and, and make them work doesn't mean not, not letting them enjoy it, uh, which also, like, leads to the example of, like, the parents that are yelling at the five-year-olds, you know, come on, you know, no, dude, let the five-year-olds, are, they're, they're, yeah, they're playing, let them, let them, living vicariously through their kids. Yeah, so, oh, that drives me nuts, man, the parents that are not competitive themselves, Want, to, want their kids to be competitors, and that is the worst. You're killing the fun for your kids. Let them grow. Let them learn. Let them have fun. Trust us as coaches. You know, if we need your help, trust me. I'm going to be the first one to be like, hey, can you grab your kid? He's not, you know, he's disrupting class or whatever it is. But, you know, but what I'm talking about is let them, bring them. We will hold them accountable. We will make them work, but bring them, you know. Um, but, yeah, those parents that live vicariously through their kids, man, and they – and they're and they get you're not even trying you know but yet they're like easily 100 pounds overweight and they're holding a thirst buster in their mouth you know they're like <laughs> <laughs> you're not even trying no you like, haven't even tried like i got a one word for you genetics right exactly <laughs> you're gonna, exactly there's, you're gonna, there's gonna be some issues there i mean i think if i could go back what i've learned in the past couple of years is I study. I love podcasts, and I study, and 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 I I listen to all your yours. But like, one thing I would have done with my kids earlier is I would have pushed competitive swimming because what you're seeing now is like the current world's strongest man, Eddie Hall. He's six three, four hundred twenty pounds, but he's he he deadlifted eleven 1, hundred. He functions better because he did competitive swimming. The, the, some of the best bench pressers in the world, Matt Wenning, had broken hips because he was hit with a car when he was five. So all he could do was get in the pool. And he benches over 600 pounds. He did all those reps for his lats. Kirill Sosaya, the Russian that benches 738. He's, what, 6'5", 400 pounds, 380. He was a competitive swimmer. Hmm. So it, it does something to your heart. I would have I, – I, my kids went to swim school, and as you know, we have a pool. But, like, they, I, I would do – if anyone's listening to this, I would have their kids in competitive swimming too. Like, in what addition what it does to your heart and your lungs? Because it's a lot of high repetition volume low oxygen yeah right? it does something it's probably like the people that go to altitude right eddie hall talks about it in one of his podcasts that like they studied his heart because after he won world's strongest man and the scientists they said your heart just works different it's probably like a randy couture right. at oh. his peak like how how they studied him and he didn't make lactic acid yeah i would say that's an advantage i Dude, mean randy couture the the pump. yeah like yeah. arnold says it's a pump, baby. It's a pump. <laughs> yeah, but Arnold, Arnold, uh, Arnold uh, Randy, man. Randy was a savage, man. I mean, to be able to do it so late in his career, you know, still 48 years old fighting kids in their 20s, peaking, you know? Fuck, man. What yeah. an animal, man. What an animal. But again, it's that mindset, man. But you just mentioned the Russians, man. 
what is it about the Russians? And I, I have an idea. I think Russians as a society are willing to make sacrifices for the sake of progress that maybe other nations or cultures in the world are not. But anything that we do, everything from lifting to wrestling to boxing to whatever it is, powerlifting, the Russians are decades ahead of us. Well, what they did was in, in the, the first people, the first, Louis Simmons will say this, the first people the Russians sent to the Olympics were their scientists. They didn't send a team. They filmed everything. They looked, they studied it, and they put their science. I mean, obviously, their system ended up not working because communism didn't work, right? And, and we beat that. But all the, all the Russian research from Prolipin and um, Medvedev and Boris Shako and these Russian influences that Louis Simmons was able to distill into a lot of their stuff makes a lot of sense. Um, some of the, I mean, I, I like to think I, I base all my knowledge from a, a, a great pool, but when I was in high school, the big, the, he just died this past year in his mid seventies, but Fred Hatfield, Dr. Fred Hatfield, um, Dr. Schwartz, you ever heard of him? No. He squatted when he was 47, he squatted 1014 and stood up at 1050 in Hawaii when Hawaii was the big meet. He was the editor. He had a PhD. So he was the editor for muscle and fitness. So he was a very well-paid guy. But anyways, my point is, this was in the mid-80s. He was the man. He benched 525 pounds and deadlifted over 800. I met him in 93 in person. Remember, I don't want to disparage anybody, but it was like meeting Mr. Magoo. He was maybe like 5'6", like, I don't know, 160. And so there's a person that got all his abilities from, he was a gymnast as a kid and an orphan went into the Marines for a while, but like he built himself up, built himself up. So in his forties, he was his best, but his Russian science and his Russian science. And you can Google this and it's free on, find it online. Russian, Russian peak for 90% of the people that might watch this, that are not trying to get into a super advanced strength athletics, put the old Russian peaking program, use 80% three times a week, once, twice for six sets of two, and then once for three sets of three sets of six, then then um, build build it up for um, six sets of four, six sets until you're at six sets of six. But eighty percent is the magic, and and Hatfield was talking about that in the eighties when I was reading. He's got books and so forth. But I've never met anybody that was as physically unimpressive that in person that was had got so much out of his body. Yeah. You know, if you ever meet somebody that's like you know, like probably in your world, like it, like maybe a Dan Gable, right? Went till he broke. Yeah. But just got so much out of his body, like his his will, you can't break it. It's indomitable. Like well, Hickson, gonna... yeah, Hickson to this day, man. Like uh, there's a, I think there's something but so powerful, powerful about his face that they keep putting it on magazines, right? Where it's just not his old, and you can see it's like the miles. Yeah, it never ends. Never ends. The effect. But you see, you, Hickson, it's almost like he props himself for this because he's all he was always the the strong Gracie, right? He oh, had he's to, proud. For, yeah. And, and he's shaking hands and stuff, and then the people walk away, and then he goes to movement, and then you realize the price that he's paid. Right. You know? Yeah. He walks with a limp, you know? And you're like, fuck, man. So <laughs> when I moved to California, my roommate, Mark Almonte, and my other roommate, Eric DeRoyne, great guys, they helped me. We moved to California to become police. But we were watching. We'd watch Lethal Weapon, and we watched Lethal Weapon, because we're like, we're going to live in L.A. We better know what it's like. But remember at the, the end famous of the triangle, weapon, the famous triangle. triangle. So yeah. my roommate Armonte is like, I know, I'm gonna study. That's these guys called the Gracies. So he used to go down to Torrance to train with them. So the first I remember he came home one night, we lived at a bachelor pad in ninety three. He goes, Hey, the UF first UFC is on. I'm like, all right, what is that? Let's watch it. It was like nine ninety nine and we watched it and we're like, Oh, Hoist Gracie, this he looked like a smaller guy to me. I'm yeah. like, Oh, he won. So then the next Saturday night, we we all went out and he's like down to the South Bay. We went to Club H2O, which is in uh, Hermosa Beach, hopping place. And um, we're like, okay, we're going to go in there. And um, then he's like, Mark, Mark Amont says, oh, the guys, the Graces are showing up. So like, here comes Hoist. And I'm like, oh, I was just saw you on TV. It was amazing. And he was real nice. Not the really, biggest guy yeah. at all. And, you know, and then like, we all had shots. We're drinking shots to celebrate your victory yeah. the week before. And all of a sudden, he like, takes my hand and like, take this. And he's nervous. And he gives me his shots. And all of a sudden, the crowd parts. Parts. It walks Hickson. Hickson who Long I hair Hickson, too. No. Who I didn't know. No, no heads given. No heads given. I didn't know who he was. And I'm like, but then I just, when you lock eyes with someone, and he was just looking at me, and I'm like. That's a killer. I felt. I felt, <laughs> I, 
I mean, I, I, I thought I was going to get pregnant yeah. or die. I don't know what he did to me. But, and he just was like, came right up. I mean, right up to Hoist. And he's like smelling him. He's like, you're not drinking, are you? No, sir. No. I mean, I saw this guy who just won the best, the biggest fighting championship in the world just wilt. Yeah. And uh, what a just like, just like a, it was like a great, like. I watch, I love Shark Week. I love shark documentaries and stuff. And when they say a shark's biting you, people look in its eyes and it's and this black dead. eye. That's, that was dead Hickson. I've never seen black eyes that were like, like frightening. And I'm like, tell Hickson, <laughs> sir, please, can I, can I help you? Yeah, Just, man. So that was 93. And then about within like 10 years later, I, I lived in California from 91 to 04. 10 years later, we used to meet with certain informants off of, we'd meet them. I'm in law enforcement, as you know, but yeah. we'd meet people that were working at LAX, but down on the Strand because they didn't want you couldn't be seen near work. They would meet right. us. So the, you know what the Strand is in Hermosa Beach, Manhattan? It's that it's the path, it, right? There, the yeah. path. And for those who grew up in the eighties and nineties, not the Beverly Hills nine hundred two one zero would show that house. That was on right. the Strand. It's it's where people. It's a beautiful place, but it's a beautiful bike path. But then you would just see like Hickson on this the most badass mountain bike covered in chains before rampage jackson was wearing big chains and he had like the scully cap on Are you talking about like like gold chains or are you talking about like weighted chains? probably like 20 or 40 pounds of chain like lifting chain before people lifting were, chain before for resistance. mainstream for resistance. and he would just be on this bike and i mean everybody he'd just go boom and we'd sit out there and he'd go back and forth and that was midday Damn, like man. son that was probably his that was probably his downtime yeah just like how you know but that dude trained his body man like I think one of the best things that uh, that he could have possibly done is that that choke documentary, when it showed like that neck exercise that he was doing, where he put the resistance band and he was tied to the wall and he like walked to the end of his carport, pulling on his neck, and then that breathing exercise. I mean, he just had such a control of his body, you know, um, from the breathing to like when they they went to fight in Japan and he submerged himself in that. That running water. That's running so water, cold. just ice. I mean, it's just surrounded by ice, and this thing is just like five degrees away from being frozen, you know? And it just jumps in there. It's just. Yeah, my, he's in a mind, mind, whatever you call it, mindful state, mindless state, yeah. where he's. It's probably an out of body experience, which right. you probably experience this as an elite athlete. Like, there's times where you just. Maybe it's the chromies after a heavy lift, or just like you, you literally like. I just did that. Yeah, you know what? A, wow, what a monster, man! But yeah, he, uh, yeah, he. There, like I said, that documentary for anybody that just starts jiu-jitsu or you started jiu-jitsu without ever going back and like and and studying the roots of Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, and Gracie jiu-jitsu, um, Hicks and Gracie choke. It's one of the best documentaries. I mean, I had it on tape and I had to buy it on DVD because. I again, I, I love sharing knowledge. So anybody that started jujitsu and wants to see that they're really interested in series, I'd be like, hey man, watch this. One, I think I saw that. It's been a while, but I think there's isn't there. It's a tournament. So after one of the fights, he comes in and the locker room, and he's kind of a little. Yeah, he's a little. Cause he was up. Fight, yeah, because he was fighting one a, a very big Japanese fighter that mm -hmm. was known for standing guillotines. Right, because he's there's a scene where he's in the locker room yeah. between fights, and his neck is. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that we call those growing pains. Yeah. Is it attached? Does it involve? Do you need so anesthesia yeah. or a copay? Well, you still it's right. You can go forward, and that's what he does. He just models that, but he's he's still somewhat human, right? Until he steps on the mat, and then he's God. Yeah. But like, but again, but then the uh, the honor, right? Because I think that that documentary shows a, a bunch of different elements of what it's what it's like to be a martial artist. Because in that tournament, there's a there's a small jet excuse me, Japanese fighter that he was fighting. We were talking about him earlier. Uh, De Pardo. Yeah, he was French, right? Yeah, the French fighter. He was fighting a small Japanese fighter that later on became very famous, but I can't remember his name right now. And he's punching him, but he starts, as he's punching, he starts eye gouging him. That Japanese fighter went on to lose that eye. and But he went on, he won that fight, and now he's fighting Hickson, and now you see backstage where they're talking about him and they're talking about him and they're saying, Hickson, like, that's your target, man. Like, get the fight early because they know he's dangerous. So they don't want the fight to, unnes to go unnecessarily long. They just want to get it done. And somebody suggests 
takes him, you need to hit him in that eye. And the referee will stop it because they're like, it was a concern already. Like the eye was shut. And Hickson looks at him and goes, no, it's not right. I can't hit him in the eye. And I think Ike Hickson actually goes the entire fight without hitting him in the face, if I remember correctly. Um, but to watch that, it's it's you can be one of the most dominating fighters in the world without having to sacrifice your morals and your values. You know, I will win without doing something that violates my code of honor. Yeah, honor you know? is... It, and and that's everywhere, that. man. That's yeah. everywhere. In, in lifting and in MMA and in... Um, and in boxing and in jiu-jitsu, it's, it, I think that's, when people talk about retaining the martial artist value, it's it's that, like, you could win without violating who you are. Um, but, you know, for example, one thing that, because I don't watch a lot of MMA, my youngest loves MMA, and one thing that's pulled me away from MMA, it's that, it's like, for example, there's uh, John Jones when he choked out, um, when he choked out uh, the dragon, what was his name? Machida. Machida. He, Machida. he choked him and then drops him He's not like you drop, like you drop a, a sack of trash, and then gets and walks away and celebrates. I knew at that moment I was done with MMA, you know. And there's been other moments where I knew I was done with MMA. I just, it's just not, you know. And from from when I from being from when I fought and from having guys compete in MMA, I just knew it wasn't my crowd, man. It just wasn't, you know. Yeah, well, you, you know, if, you know when you're true to yourself, what speaks to you, right? You know, when I was. My last year of high school, first year of college, I was taking American style Taekwondo at a school called One Step Beyond, which was, there was a sensei was Otto Pozo. There was a sensei, Jeff White, and they would talk about like Taekwondo matches. So I, I was doing it and um, I liked it. But then if we tied up and I was strong, I was just throwing people around. I was already getting, getting pretty big and strong. I mean, I squatted over 500 and benched three, over 300 and deadlifted almost six. Couldn't get 600 till I was 20, but I was strong. So I, that was what spoke to me. But I think back, like my base, we would do all kinds of stretching. I mean, my, they would put me against the wall, put my foot behind my head. Right. Yeah. What was what was Hat, Hatfield term that PNF stretching, like um, whatever the fancy scientific, you're pushing yourself past your limits. And I did that for two years. So to this day, like I said, that was almost 30 years ago. I've never pulled a hamstring. I've never had a lower. I've never had a significant lower body injury. I, I tweaked that knee, but it, it got better. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's all about laying the base. But I mean, I had that. Even doing that though, like martial arts didn't speak to me, like lifting the weights. Okay. But I can yeah. so much appreciate. And I looked at myself always as like during the. You remember this during the build up of the late eighties and the nineties. Tyson, Tyson. To me, Tyson was like like that Sean Colbeth, and and just a phenom was kicking everyone's ass. But man, I always watch Holyfield. He was a cruiserweight, and that was my plan. And Holyfield hired Hatfield, and he trained him for a while. He built his body from like one seventy-five to two, only probably two thirty, right. and beat Tyson. Beat everybody was the heavyweight champ because he did it. One of the smallest heavyweight champions of modern time. Because right. so the the smallest heavyweight champion was Ali, that barely weighed like one night, and that was considered. Uh, Two oh eight, I think was yeah, that was considered big. But Holyfield, I think like he struggled to maintain anything like over 220, 230, you know, because he was naturally lean, but he had those fucking traps, right? He built but his he, shoulders and body correctly. But he moved but he, and he moved. He was always like even in his late years, he was always he always had that condition, that balance, you know, the movement that the heavyweights didn't have. But yeah, but it was that was the style when watching that fight, Tyson versus versus uh, Holyfield. It was that unstoppable machine that Mike Tyson was versus a real boxer. It, it was love and honor, which is Holyfield. Holyfield loved the sport, never right. disgraced it, right. and honored it. And as much as Tyson, you got to appreciate him, he was an aberration by then. He would have been out of, uh, out of out prison, prison say what you will, but he snapped to bite someone, like you said, yeah. and – in this day, well, that was desperation. That was desperation. He, right. he himself talked about it, where he was, he started, he started making excuses. He started complaining that that Holyfield, and now Holyfield wasn't doing anything that he hadn't done before. He Holyfield always came in with his head, and they were clashing heads. And Tyson knew that his boxing started to get overwhelmed, so he started complaining of the headbutt and just lost his mind, man, and bit him. Yeah, he he, he snapped. Yeah. Yeah. I get. I guess it's it's worked out. He's looked he's looked at favorably. He's an icon, but. I mean, Holyfield, let's be honest, he did it right. You know, because there's no Tyson with his natural ability. If he kept that, it didn't get soft. 
he should have gone 100 no and be undefeated and yeah you know. tyson uh, what happened unfortunately what happened for tyson was that he lost every he lost that bear he was such a wild kid that he truly needed that solid foundation around him to keep him from going out of the path again and those were his boxing trainers and yeah custom auto once he passed yeah, once he passed and, and i think it was custom auto's son that kind of take try to take over that but he just didn't have the same buy with tyson and once he started messing around with the with the with the muslim brotherhood and um don king don king started taking advantage of him but now it was it was just him again trying to keep his world together but the problem that i the problem with with tyson is that he started he was the boss you know and like I know you see a lot of guys that do the same thing with uh, with MMA, where they're the boss, and I'm paying you to come train me. You know, if I'm the trainer and a student comes in to train with me, I have free reign to 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 offer them criticism, to offer them guidance, to tell them what I want. And ultimately, if it's not working out, then you know, you tell the guys like, "Hey, I'm sorry, you're not you're not working out. Go to another gym. Maybe maybe you listen to somebody else, or or simply you're not listening to what I'm trying to tell you. This relationship is not going to work. When you're the hired gun to train Mike Tyson, he's the boss. How do you tell Mike Tyson that he's not running enough? You know, right? How do you tell Mike Tyson that he's not jump rope enough? How do you tell Mike Tyson that he's not watching his diet? Because the second he doesn't like what you say, what you're saying, you're out. You know. And it was the same thing with like Kroka, you know, in MMA. Is Kroka, Kroka was always the boss. You know, he never went and trained under somebody, especially like in his MMA career. Like you see Kroka trying to figure out cage work on his own, you know. He never went under somebody and said, okay, teach me. You know, he was just, he would bring in people. But again, you know, it's, uh, he would pay somebody, okay, I'm, I need you for five weeks, here's $20,000, you know, and you're just that higher gun. How do you tell Kroka that he's doing it wrong? Just yeah, twenty thousand dollars in five weeks. Yeah, right. Yeah, and so that's why when you see those programs like MMA, like the, they'll say, "Oh, they went I went out to Albuquerque to Winkle John Jackson, Jackson's yeah. camp," and that that's the same thing I, with jujitsu. That's the same thing with powerlifting. My my best gains came when I had training partners that were similar goals, and and I've always been from back to when my first training partner, Rafi Yassan. I had a guy named Steve Randolph. Like I said, Jim Soroka. I can name these guys. They're all successful. I, I love those guys. There's there's friends in your life, and then in my world, there's training partners. That I've never had somebody I call a training partner that's that's ever not been successful, but it's ever not like you know you might end up going different ways, and and it, for whatever reason, because life happens. But that, to be successful, you need to be around other like-minded people and always around somebody stronger. Like you, like they, I don't we didn't talk about this before, but like how our paths ended up crossing. But like like the guy we referenced before, um, Josh Bryant, who runs Jailhouse Strong as his company, but his best friend is Adam Benjay. So when Josh would train with us, he'd always talk about Adam Benjay. And I met Adam in the in the nineties, and I'm like, man, you should lift weights. And he's like, I do, but I'm into jujitsu. I didn't know that much about it, but he was Frangina's first black belt in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. What a small world. I mean, yeah. think about um, how those things converge. You know what I'm saying? But because I, I knew about that a long time ago, but you know, those two push each other. Now they have a very successful company in jail. Strong. They have like five or six books on Amazon. They have YouTube. They do, you know, they have Instagram and so forth, but social media, they have it covered, but they're, they're both best friends in different worlds that have, it's been a synergistic relationship. Absolutely. And like how, and it's again, like my side is I was a blue belt competing at the pants and, uh, and I, I, I got to the final, so I lost to a gentleman from Spain. Um, that, that's a that's a blue belt, and uh, so got second place. So now I'm just walking around, and uh, and Paragon is just killing it, you know. And uh, and I'm watching from Gina, and he had a um, he had this black belt, phenomenal athlete, and uh, I can't remember his name. Um, yeah, it'll come to me. And they got the guys in the finals and they're celebrating and stuff. But I, you know, I, from that moment on, like I started watching the Paragon competitors and they kind of like started following the Paragon mindset. And then thank God for, you know, for YouTube and social media, because from there on, it's like, you know, little did I know that from what started something that, you know, as a blue belt, I'm, I started watching YouTube, you know, it was, and it was very primitive as far as the techniques that were available online. But I, I just, I just, I would just watch tape. I would just pull up. 
their fights and their techniques and stuff. And later on, I went to Frangina's and Brown Belt, and it's exactly that. Like, we understood that we had to, you know, for the people, again, they're, oh, you have to make a, a five-hour drive or a like, three-hour drive. You got to drive 20 minutes. Fuck, man. Philip and I, we drove to Ventura, you know, and we wanted to stay in the in the gym. of Frangina would let us. He kept us in his house. But we knew that we had to sharpen our blade, you know. So we went over there, and that's and every year, every every year we go we go to Ventura to train with those guys. And if you if you want to be successful, you have to surround yourself with those people that are that know the formula, and that they themselves, like you said, lead by example. You know, um, there's this uh, big Viking in uh, that they're Viking over there in California. Um, and uh, me and him were paired up, and we, Frangina was making us do like, a, you know, you're standing in line, and then you get to the center, and Frangina would say, okay, takedowns, you know, and you wrestle till you take him down, and you get taken down, and it's a fight, you know. So me, me and, uh, and this Viking of a man got paired up, and we just wrestled, and we finished, and now we're against the wall, and both of us were like, you know, because we were training partners, so it was like guard, guard, you know, so like, you start in the guard and you fight until you sweep or you get your guard pass, you know? So it's hard work, but so now we're against the wall and we're just kind of like leaning there and, um, and we're like congratulating each other for the effort, but you look, and we, so we look back into the mat and Frangina is in there battling a, another black belt easily 10, 15 years younger than him. And Frangina is going toe to toe with this kid and, and wins the drill. And me and this guy, we went from just exhausted to, man, that's the general, you know? He's doing the formula. He knows the formula, but he's leading by example. So not that we were looking for our way out, but both of us at that moment understood, like, okay, that's the example. We, we need to, we have to do this. There's no quitting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's always how I've been. I'm not just a lifter. I'm a fan. Yeah. I, I, I just, I've always wanted to be, like, next to... Um, and around the strongest, right? Because that's what I'm trying to become, and the strongest I can become. And you know, I, I, I was competitive, and uh, but like, I just it, it just it blows you away. You know, I trained for, uh, in addition to strong, powerlifting, I did a strongman. I did America's Strongest Man in '05, so I was 37. I had come back. I had broke my arm bench pressing. Don't do that. It hurt. Mm -hmm. I've torn tendons. Breaking an arm hurt, but I came back. So, and at the time I was training with Josh Bryant. So three plates on the bars, 320. I wanted to, we did a thing where you take it off the squat stands and you press it strict. You can do a little jerk, but press it above your head. And I'm like, 320, I got three plates. And then and Josh kicked off a 445. But I, but I'm like, I, I, it, it's like the ocean. I love the ocean, right? You know, um, love the waves. I can't, I could, I'd die if I was a surfer, but I see those surfers. Yeah. First time I, I took my wife, we went to Hawaii on our honeymoon. And I'm like, ah, oh, the waves, I'm going to go out. We went out to this place, Sandy Beach, and I was only up to my knees. And the wave, there was a sign, like, you know, how the, you have the signs, like, even shows the illegal yeah. things crossing the freeway or, or railroad crossing. Right, this yeah. sign on the beach showed a wave crashing down on somebody, like, don't go in. I'm like, this ain't, this ain't yeah. anything. I walk in, the water's only up to my knees. The wave reared up to, like, that red thing and smashed me, and, like, smashed us apart. But, like, what a rush. <laughs> what a rush. <laughs> what a rush. <laughs> I mean, I remember, <laughs> you know, my wife, but like her bikini top went flying. Yeah. And the, 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 uh, yeah, the, the, um, and so we come up and we're separated 200 feet. Yeah. Sand. I'm like all cattywampus and my sunglasses are gone. And, and like she's away from me. I, first thing I go to get her. And the, uh, the lifeguard's like, see the right sign, brother. Bro. <laughs> so, but like the power, if you don't feel it, I mean, right. like Mark Bell, the guy that publishes this magazine. Um, says we're all gonna die, but like take a take a ride. Don't take be ride, don't man. be ir irresponsible. Don't be. But like but take a ride. Man. I want to end this with with it. two thoughts, man, regarding that. And number one is like you you you're talking about like you came in fifth, and and I'm talking about like you know like after years of competition or like years of taking time from away from competition, just heal. Like I had two shoulder surgeries and my knee and stuff. So we we'll come back, man, and I've, I've I end up second in the in the pants, you know, like we, we're going, we're going for gold, you know, but I end up second, you end up fifth in like this major tournaments and, but we're running with the wolves, man. And I think that's what people, what people need to take away from that is number one, it's you're doing it, man. You're doing it. Don't be so afraid of failure that you 
don't even try. Like, you don't even get out there. You know, like, you ended up fifth. Yeah, but that's fifth in the sea of monsters, man. That's fifth with the top five guys in the world, you know? Yeah, I ended up second in the, in the in pants, man. I will come back for first, you know? But I ended up second in, in the sea of monsters. Like, these guys are competing. They're the best in the world. I'm facing black belts that... You know, they're coming from Brazil. You know, I'm facing black belts that are coming from other parts of the world that we're all meeting in this day, all trying to be the top dog, you know? So I'm not satisfied to say, oh man, I took second, I'm happy. I'm proud of my effort. I want to, I will come back for first. And just like you said, like you're coming back to competition to come back for that first. But let's not take away the achievement that it is to say, you know what, man, I'm running with the wolves. And, and I tell people that all the time. And it's like, yeah, I took second. Yeah, man, but you took second out of the five, six, seven, ten, fifteen guys that showed up saying, I'm in. Like nobody shows up. Ah oh, man, I I hope I just hope I, I make some friends, you know. No, no, everybody shows up saying, I, I'm here to win, you know. Um just like CT Fletcher. It's like quoted, man, when he walks in. You walk into the warm up room, and the warm up room is it's tense. You know, everybody's kind of looking around. You're going to figure out when you're going to start. But he's like, he'd say, which one of y'all motherfuckers is coming in second? Because that trophy's mine. First place. Just showed up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have have at it. The side would take second. Warm third. up that bar. Because after you go, then it's my attempts. Jesus. Go Christ, at it. Man. And yeah. that's the mindset. It encapsulates it perfect for yeah. anything. Yeah. Beautiful, man. Paul. Thank you for having me on. Oh, thank you, man. We'll have to we'll have to keep bringing you back because we we could be here for for hours. But your wife's gonna start yelling. Yeah, well, it's Sunday, so my church is the gym. So I got a crew coming over at noon today. We're gonna hit it. Oh. And uh, animals, man. Yeah, it's awesome. Awesome. Well, thank man. you for having me. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.